thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, while you're trickling in, I'm going to do a bit of an introduction here. I'm Steve Carlson. I'm a staff member at Practical Farmers of Iowa. I am in the, the PFI office here in Ames, Iowa, in Central Iowa. Um, so if you haven't already shared in the chat box there where you're tuning in from, please do that. That's kind of fun to see. Um, and then in that bottom left corner, down in the lower left corner of your screen is a little poll that helps us kind of get a head count of how many people are watching these things. So um, yeah, if you're watching with a couple of people, check the right box down there so we get an idea how many are tuning in. Yeah, it looks like we got a couple of people from Michigan, Kathy from Oxford, Iowa, Carl from Pennsylvania. Good to see some familiar faces and some new ones. So yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, as you're aware, tonight we've got Rachel Ackerman, who is our guest speaker. She uh, is from Blue Sky Flower Farm near Elko Newmarket, Minnesota. And Rachel's farm is um, just south of the Twin Cities. And Rachel and her husband, John, raise cut flowers and woody ornamental plants for wholesale to garden centers and landscape companies and florists. And we're glad to have her um, tonight share about their whole operation when it comes to woody ornamentals. So thanks, Rachel, for taking the time to talk to us. So first, I'm going to, uh, before turning it over to Rachel, I'm going to say a few things about PFI. And this is uh, one of our farminars. We've been doing farminars for 10 years now, and we've got over 140 of these farminars uh, recorded and in our archives. And there's a link at the bottom of this slide here to find our archive. If there's a topic that you're interested in, there's probably a good chance we've done uh, a farminar topic on it before. So check out that archive when you get a, a cold night like tonight. We're not doing anything live on the farminars. So um, dig through there. See, I'm sure you'll find something that's interesting. This is the rest of our winter farminar series. Last week we did one on permaculture. That's um, Claire Hintz. It's already in our archives. Uh, we've got some great topics coming up. We do a whole diversity of, um, of farm and our topics from cover crops to livestock to woody ornamentals. So um, make sure to mark your calendars for anything in the future that uh, piques your interest. So Practical Farmers of Iowa, um, we've been around for just over 30 years now. We're a member-based farmer-led organization. We're a nonprofit. Uh, we like to say that we are a big tent, meaning we uh, welcome people from farming of all backgrounds and enterprises, uh, horticulture, livestock, row crops, organic, conventional, and we try and provide programming for all those things. And uh, so you can see that in the diversity of our farm and our topics on that last slide. Our mission at Practical Farmers of Iowa is strengthening farms and communities through farmer-led investigation and information sharing to help farmers practice in agriculture that benefits the land and the people. And we accomplish this mission through a lot of different activities. We do on-farm research through our cooperators program where we help farmers design and implement replicated on-farm research trials on whatever issues that they're curious about on their farm. And we help farmers share the results of those research trials and share their experience with uh, growing whatever crops they are growing. Uh, through field days, which we do uh, throughout the summer months, through um, workshops and socials, and we help we want farmers to share their experience through these farminars. This is a great way to keep um, the knowledge sharing going in the in the off season. And then, of course, this week is our granddaddy of all PFI events, our big annual conference that's here in Ames, Iowa. You should go to that website, pficonference.org. It's happening on Friday and Saturday on the ISU campus. Our theme this year for the conference is Revival, where we want to help uh, work toward reviving rural communities with healthy family farms and clean water and clean soil. And throughout the two days of this conference, we've got over 50 sessions, uh, mostly farmer-led. We ask people to, um, to come to these uh, conference, to, to come to our conference and share um, what they're doing on their farms and teach other people about what works and what doesn't work. And uh, the keynote at our at our big granddaddy event this year is New York Times best-selling author James Rebanks, who is a shepherd from the UK. We're flying him all the way from Europe. It's a pretty big deal. So that's Friday night at our conference. Again, go get all the details at uh, pficonference.org. We did close down pre-registration, but walk-ins are definitely welcome. So if you haven't already planned on coming to Ames this weekend for the conference, check out those details and join us. 
Speaking of join us, we are a member-led organization, so if you like what we do, you should become a member. Um, there's a ton of benefits for being a member, like discounts to this annual conference. You get extreme discounts to a lot of events. Uh, if they're not a free event, then PFI members at least get a discounted rate. Um, we also have email discussion groups. You get our quarterly newsletter. You can participate in our on-farm research, any of our beginning farmer programs. Um, there's a lot of benefits to a PFI membership, so you can read about that on our website or talk to me. I'd be happy to tell you about PFI. Now, a couple of rules real quick. Um, use that chat box uh, to ask your questions. Rachel is, uh, Rachel is here to talk about her farm, and so feel free to ask her um, whatever questions that you have. Um, I want to ask that you please try and stay on topic because she's going to cover a lot of ground. And uh, there's a good chance she might be, you know, get she might get to her marketing a little bit later. Um, so just hold on to some off-topic questions. We are going to save time at the end of her presentation for everything that she didn't cover. So feel free to put them in the chat box. If she doesn't get to it, um, I'll make sure that we circle back to it at the end of the presentation. So, so definitely use that. Um, I do want to ask for your feedback too. So there's a there's a link right there to a Survey Monkey survey. Um, that at the end of the presentation, I'd love for you to fill that out, give us some feedback on tonight, but then also that's where you can let us know what topics you want to hear about in the future. So if you click that link now, it should open in your web browser. You can save that till after. Um, otherwise, I will put that link in the chat box later. So we do appreciate your feedback very much. And if you want to stay up to date with our farminars, um, there's a link right there to sign up for our email list. So um, please do that. It looks like everybody in the chat box gets the idea. It's fun to see where you're tuning in from. So uh, if you haven't already shared that, we've got more people from Michigan. This is crazy. I've never seen so many people from Michigan. Um, of course, a lot of Iowans. That's great. So, um, oh, hey, Clara. Decora. All right. So, yeah, uh, let us know where you're tuning in from. And if you didn't already, check the box in that lower left corner about how many people are watching with you on this farm and Go ahead and do that. Like I said, it's it's important for us to have kind of a head count for how many people we reach for these. Um, and that, I think, is all that I've got. So I'm going to switch the presentations here and pull Rachel's up. And Rachel Ackerman from Blue Sky Flower Farm is going to talk to us about woody ornamentals. Good. Okay, I see that we're up. Thank you very much, Steve. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, all right. There you go. Good? We're good. Okay. Yep, sure okay, can. Thank you, Steve. So we are going to dive into growing woodies as cut flowers. And I'm going to start here with my first slide. This is a picture of me and I have three kids and my husband. Uh, Violet, Leo, and Ollie. They are six, four, and two. And my husband, John, um, helps a lot on Blue Sky Flower Farm. He has a full-time off-the-farm job, but um, whenever I can get his help, I, I take advantage of it. Um, so just a little bit of my background. I started in horticulture when I was 15 years old. Uh, my mom <laughs> told me that I needed a job and to make my, make some, start making my own money. And so I thought I would work at our local nursery because I could get a suntan and be outside all summer. And that's, uh, that's sort of where it started. And ever since then, I've always been in some aspect of horticulture um, in some way. We, my husband and I uh, started Blue Sky Flower Farm. Um, he is from a dairy farm out west, Hutchinson, Minnesota. And so his uh, dad gave us a small part of an old cow pasture, and we thought we would trial some willows and dogwoods. And that's how Blue Sky was born. Uh, about four years ago, it'll be four years in June, we are able to buy our own farm. We live in Elko New Market. Um, we're right off 35, if you know where that is, about a half an hour, roughly 30 minutes south of Minneapolis, St. Paul. We're zone four uh, hardiness. Right now, what we are talking, it's about negative five, negative 10, feels like negative 20. So it's a little chillier up here. Uh, we grow about 30 different types of woodies. We actively are harvesting probably five to 10 of those varieties, actually maybe about half of them. Uh, we also grow, um, we have over a thousand peonies planted. 
Uh, we do annuals. Uh, we also grow some dahlias, perennials, ornamental grasses. Uh, we have a really small farm. Our, we have less than two acres um, in field production with all of our flowers and our woodies. So I'm a stay-at-home mom by trade. I worked full-time up until I had my second child, and then I decided that I, I wanted to spend more time with them. So they're part of every day uh, harvesting. This is a picture of some of my flowers that I have, uh, them washing buckets, and they, I take them on my deliveries to florists sometimes. So it gets a little, a little crazy, uh, but just so you have a little idea, um, of how how our farm works. Um, it's family for family oriented. Um, so that's a little snapshot into that. So here's what I'd like to cover. Uh, just in general, getting started, what tools you need. I'll go through a lot of the varieties that um, I either have in production or that I am trialing. Um, some growing practices that work well for us. Uh, also, uh, harvest tips, post-harvest tips, propagation. I'm going to spend a good chunk of time on some challenges um, that we have when growing woodies. A uh, little bit of avenue of sales, who we sell to, um, some references, information, uh, where do you find the supplies and products that I talk about, and then a little bit on social media and our advertising. <clears throat> so when we are getting started, uh, new beds, new areas, new plants, um, everything we have has a plan. So before we even start planting, um, this time of the year I'm going through and making master lists of um, what we have ordered. Uh, is it coming in bare root? Is it something that we took cuttings of? Um, we have all of our fields. Um, I'll show some pictures coming up. They're labeled. So we have uh, field one and field two, and then each field is assigned a row. And so when we are mapping out exactly um, this winter when I'm going through and kind of figuring out where we're going to put all this stuff that looks so cool that I just had to have, um, when it arrives, we have a spot for it. So it'll go through all of our spacing, which row. It's a complete map um, of everything we need for those new varieties. Uh, most woodies uh, expect, just kind of in the back of your head if you're growing them, it's going to be... Um, some of the dogwoods and willows, you might get some harvest the first couple years, but just average, just speaking, um, you won't really see a lot of return on your investment until year three. Um, a lot of things, too, are even after the fifth year. Uh, so you have to do a little bit of upfront work um, before you start to be able to get some good harvests off um, what you've planted. So this is when we're getting started. These are our go-to tools. We have loppers. Um, we have the A.M. Leonard soil knife. Uh, most of our harvesting is done. I'll grab my little pointer there. Um, see if I can drag them down here with Falco number twos. Um, and then for the thicker stuff, we're using these uh, loppers up here. But this is uh, just in general, we load up. This is our peony planting this year. This wasn't woodies, but peonies will load up with everything we need to plant. So we bring it out there. We're not making multiple trips. We have our fabric, our shovels. Um, you can see, I'll point right here. This will come in handy a little bit later. We uh, plant everything in weed fabric. I'll show you that. Um, and we use a blowtorch to blow circle holes in. Um, so that's all loaded up. This orange bucket here is full of fertilizer. Um, so that's, that's uh, us getting started um, before, we even, before we even do anything, we get organized. So, I'm going to jump right into varieties. Uh, feel free to ask uh, any questions along along the way. We'll just, this is sort of a lineup, this image here of our bread and butter of our business. It, we sell most a, a large majority of willows uh, and dogwoods. Uh, we harvest woodies almost throughout the season with a little exception now here in the winter when it's been too cold. Uh, in the fall, we are harvesting dogwoods and willows uh, around the end of October. In the spring, we're doing mostly pussy willows. Throughout the summer, um, excuse me, late spring, summer, we're doing a lot of foliage and flowers. Uh, so we'll kind of break into that. So uh, when it comes to dogwoods, we these are our three main dogwoods, uh, red twig, uh, cardinal dogwoods, and the yellow twig. Um, cardinal, I'll grab my pointer here. This one right here is our number one seller. It's gonna be uh, more of a red-orange color. Um, 
most of these dogwoods, uh, when you're starting to grow them, you can find them either by cuttings, um, you can plant them bare root, or you can find containers from a local re, uh, re-wholesaler or garden center. You, and it just depends. Um, the smaller plant that you start with will obviously be cheaper, but it will take longer than to produce and maybe some of the larger container plants. So it's, it's kind of what you can get your hands onto or what you're comfortable with planting. Uh, when we plant, we do plant with a slow release fertilizer. I'll show an example of that. Um, and a lot of these will harvest everything to about four inches, the entire plant four inches to the ground. And I do have some um, slides of that I'll show. Uh, we try not to harvest until we've had some hard frost. Uh, the hard frost really intensifies the colors of the dogwood. So you'll see a definite difference after a hard frost, the reds and the yellows uh, will definitely be more intense and they will also be defoliated, which is very helpful so we're not hand defoliating. Um, you can expect uh, to get 15 to 35 stems off each plant. Um, so if you're figuring out your budget, what you um, think that you could make you know, per bundle um, and you're figuring out your estimates, plan, to, plan for that range. Um, it's a bit of a range. The cardinals, we don't get as many branches off because of its growing habits as we do the yellow and, the yellow and red twig. Um, so that's why I, kinda, I kept it around 15 to 35 stems per plant. Um, move around here. Some of the uh, varieties of willows that we grow, uh, most uh, people really love curly willows. So we will do, um, let's see, let me bring this right here. Uh, corkscrew willow is a curly green willow. Um, this one right here is golden curls. And these two right here are scarlet. It's, uh, the picture doesn't do it justice, but it's a very deep curly red willow. And this kind of gives you an idea of some of our sizes. So these are uh, bundled in tens. We'll go through that and then they're bulk bundled after that. This right here is flame willow. It's not curly. It's a straight, really, really bright orange willow. Um, it was a very nice one too. Uh, we do fantail willows. And so fantails have this fasciated, they call it fasciated growth. It's really wide. Um, really funky, kind of like a Dr. Seuss um, alien plant. It's very different, but um, when you plant these, uh, you will get about anywhere, I mean, it, it really depends, um, 15 to 25%, maybe a little bit more we've seen the last year of this growth. The rest of the stems will be straight. Um, and then we harvest those straight stems and just sell them in the spring as pussy willows. And we harvest these contorted fasciated stems we harvest in the fall um, and use those in our fall uh, program that we send out. They're going to be this really pretty chartreuse red and as they dry and people use them for their planters they'll turn to more of a golden brown. Uh, pussy willows. Um, we do a lot of pussy willows in the spring. This one um, right here, we, we label it large budded because it has quite a bit larger bud than just the regular American pussy willow, which is Salix discolor. This one, um, if you're writing down varieties, is Salix chemiloides. Um, it has a very, very large um, bud. And so um, these are pretty widely available. Um, they're really easy just to grow from cuttings. Um, I know my mother-in-law gets all of her pussy willow cuttings from her neighbor and her neighbor, and um, they're very easy to start um, start that way. So you, um, when you're looking for different pussy willow varieties, we look for catkins or what they call, um, uh, let me grab my arrow here, the little parts right here. We look for anything, any type of pussy willow that has something unique, either a large or if it's pink. There are some black um, pussy willows, uh, too, that we have trialed. Um, let's see, I can show you an example of uh, making sure to pick them at the right time. So you'll want to harvest your pussy willows. Let me grab my arrow here. Um, somewhere around this stage just when they are starting to open. So um, they'll just be starting to swell uh, a little bit. 
um, this spot right here, this would be, this is letting them go too long. So once they've opened and start getting pollen like this, um, then that, that is um, too late of a stage for harvest. So we, we actually, um, we don't do a whole lot of harvesting ahead of time. I know there are some growers that haven't had as cold of temperatures as we've had in Minnesota and they're harvesting right now and you can bring them in and force them. And so they take roughly about three weeks to force. So uh, the reason I say that it's been too cold for us, I should clarify that is if I went out there right now with these temperatures, they're so cold that the stems are really brittle. They would just, they're, they'd, they'd break. Um, we like it to warm up just a little bit before we start harvesting. But if you're in an area where it's not negative 10 and you're able to harvest, um, you can bring them in. They take about three weeks to force. Um, you wanna mimic spring temperatures. That's my only recommendation. Um, the picture on the right here, they will put on a ton of root growth, especially if you try to force them too hot. Instead of breaking bud, you will get roots. So that's what this picture is. Um, most of our pussy willows, we do late spring. I just take them right out of the field and we bring them right to our local garden centers. We haven't done too much forcing, um, forcing with them, but, but a lot of people do. Um, on average, as far as stem count, you can get 25 to 40 stems per plant um, on these. So for Scythia, we do grow some for Scythia. Uh, the variety that I have planted out is called Northern Gold. Um, there are a few other varieties, Metal Lark, Northern Sun. If you're in Zone 5 and listening, Linwood Gold is another one I know a lot of people use. Um, they're really easy to grow from cuttings. Um, just make sure you're not using a patented variety, which we will I'll touch on that a little bit later on. Um, they're really easy to grow from bare root and you can also find them in containers from garden centers. Um, for Scythia will flower before they get leaves. And so the time to harvest these is when you see a bud just starting to color. So the ones I have pictured here, they're already open. Um, that's what they look, uh, that's what they look like if just left in the field. Um, they flower for us usually the first couple weeks of April in Minnesota is about their typical time. They have roughly a six to 10 day base life. Um, you can use a floral preservative if you're um, listening in and you're a farm, flower farmer, you can use a floral preservative to extend your harvest. Uh, one of the tricky things that sometimes people ask is they have erratic flowering. So they'll harvest all these stems at the proper stage, but they're only getting a few flowers or they're random. And usually that is from flower buds, um, having too hard of a, the flower buds freezing, um, too hard of, a fr uh, hard of a freeze on them. You will still see foliage, but the flower buds are not as cold hardy as the foliage buds. <clears throat> Excuse me, and when you're looking at the stems, you'll see a really thick, chubby bud. Those will be your flower buds. Um, the leaf buds are gonna be a little bit thinner. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so the reason I bring this up is when you're picking your variety, make sure you pick a variety that's hardy for you. Um, so you're not having buds um, freeze off. Sometimes it's inevitable, but the hardier the better. And a tall variety. Um, raspberries. So uh, raspberries is the number one foliage that I sell to florists. Um, believe it or not, I had a 150 foot roll raspberries and then we've had the uh, spotted fly, Drosophilia, that little um, gnat that is, or excuse me, fruit fly that's inve infesting all the fruit. We've had trouble with that, so we haven't been able to harvest our fruit anymore, or I should say as much as my child is eating all of it, but um, it is our number one uh, foliage that we sell. It's it's really easy. We start these bare root in the spring. Uh, we plant about the third week of April, just little raspberries, bare root. Uh, most of mine I order from Norse Farms on the East Coast. They're uh, like a mail order company. Um, I got really good quality plants from them. And then I just um, directly plant them um, third week of April. Make sure that they're watered in really well um, if you've never planted bare root raspberries. And then once you have them, they're going to kind of, they come up, <laughs> come up everywhere. Uh, they're a little aggressive. So I do... Uh, I have thornless and ones um, with thorns. 
Um, I see a question just popped up about the um, raspberry supplier Norse Farms is N O U R S E is Norse Farms. Um, you can just order them online, and um, and they they um, ship them to you, and they're very helpful uh, if you have questions on growing or variety specific. Um, so we do, I have half in a um, thornless and half uh, with thorns. The thorn, the florists definitely prefer the ones without thorns, um, but they will take the ones with thorns too. So um, these are really easy to harvest. Um, I basically take my buckets out into the field and I um, prune them and I take the bottom one third of the leaves off. I bundle them in fives or tens and I stick them right in the buckets of water. Those go right in my vehicle and I cut them the same day that I deliver. Um, they will last weeks. Um, they don't need a flower preservative. They're very easy. Uh, definitely recommend it. The only challenge that I've had with this variety is that they're a magnet for Japanese beetles. So if you have, uh, are in an area with high pressure on Japanese beetles, um, that that might be uh, a little bit of a a little bit of a challenge. I uh, one of the markets I was selling into um, is a chemical free market, and so um, it's really hard to control Japanese beetles, anyways, especially on a fruit crop. Uh, so I did manually remove these. I had to do it sometimes three to four times a day, and I fed them to my chickens. But um, that's the only way I could keep clean. Towards the end of the season, they are really the Japanese beetles had really taken a toll on them. Um, how long are the stems when they're cut? I usually cut around 30 inches. Sometimes, sometimes a little bit shorter than that, um, more 24 inches to 30 inches. I would say I won't go any shorter than that. And then I defoliate the bottom, the bottom third wrap with a rubber band, um, and then right into water so they stay hydrated. Uh, mock orange is another one of my favorite plants. Um, I plant these from bare root. Uh, I use a double, and there are a ton of different varieties. Some people prefer the single flowers. Uh, I really like the double flowers. Um, these are going to flower for you the first, well, in Minnesota, excuse me, in Minnesota, they flower about the first week of June. Uh, the slide on the right here is the stage that I harvest them at. So the buds are open with just a few flowers open. Um, these are the ones I had cut for uh, florist fresh uh, fresh for her. So um, again, I defoliate the bottom third of the leaves. I cut and bundle these in the field. I take my buckets out with me. Um, and they are extremely fragrant. Uh, they're wonderful. It's it's sort of a short window of opportunity with these. I don't, um, I've never tried forcing them. I don't, um, I don't extend them, but you could put them in a cooler if you needed them for an event that was later. Um, but I, once I see them in this stage, I usually try to cut them and have them have them um, out the door. Uh, let's see. Oh, I'll back up a quick. I see a few questions on the raspberry. The thornless variety that I use is called Joan J. Joan, like the woman's name, J. I think there might be another variety too. That's a variety that um, I really like. You can also use um, blackberries. Um, I know some people do blackberries. I'm just gonna throw that out there. Blackberries sometimes do are more susceptible to diseases. So if you if you can grow blackberries or you do already have blackberries, don't plant your raspberries right next to it. Um, it'll keep your raspberries a little bit cleaner. Um, the raspberries I harvest all year long. I harvest them um, all summer. Even when they started to get the uh, a little bit of a fruit and a little bit of a flower, I harvested them with that on it too. Um, it was an all season, every a weekly a weekly foliage crop for me. Uh, the mock orange, uh, I uh, order my bare root. I do a, a bare root order from Bailey Nurseries. Um, it's a wholesale nursery um, that grows bare root in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, they're a supplier for most of the bare root that I I have listed here. Uh, lilacs. Um, so uh, lilacs, I know can be a little bit tricky. Um, I 
I have some already established on the farm that I've been cutting off of, and then I have planted some more. Um, they are they are a, about a five year crop for me for for from once I start bare root. So I do have some planted. I haven't harvested off that. Um, you want to harvest roughly when they're half to two thirds of the flowers are open. Um, I remove all of the foliage, all of the foliage, because it helps in keeping moisture in the plant. I don't, I don't leave any of the foliage on. Uh, it's really important not to harvest these if you've had rain or they're wet or they have dew on them. Um, you want to make sure your flowers are completely dry. The lilacs completely dry during harvest. Um, and also it's best to do it right away in the morning. Uh, you can also do it in the evening, but if you can do it right away in the morning, kind of in between when the dew dries before it gets too hot, uh, that's going to be the best bet. Um, this is just a variety, this purple one I had at our farm. Um, a lot of growers I know use Catherine, Havemeyer, or Beauty of Moscow um, are some popular vi uh, varieties. Um, some people really like the dark purples. Um, some people like sort of the, the blushes and whites. It's just kind of a personal preference. So you'll have to take a look at them and see uh, which different varieties you like. I typically stay in the Vulgaris. That's the name of this um, uh, type of um, hydrangea. So they're going to have a taller stem. There's a lot of other ones you can use too. I haven't done anything with the smaller, more dwarf varieties like Miss Cam or Dwarf Korean Lilac. Um, I would look for ones that have some height on it so you can get some nice long stems. Uh, so um, even if you're not using your lilacs for fresh cuts, make sure you're deadheading them in the spring every year just to re-encourage that growth. Um, so whether you're using them or not, go through and deadhead them. After they're done flowering, don't wait until the fall to do that. Um, if uh, uh, lilacs set their flower buds in the fall. So I've had a lot of people say they have lilacs and they never get flowers on them. It's because they're being cut in the fall when their flower buds have already set. Um, they can be susceptible to powdery mildew in the summer. Um, there's not a whole lot you can do besides good air, uh, promoting good air circulation between your plants. Um, the other only other thing I've seen on it is uh, it's a like a bacterial blight called Pseudomonas. Um, if you see that, you, you can look it up. But basically, your flower will turn black and it'll have sort of like a shepherd's hook look. It really affects your flower. Um, that happens um, sometimes in mild, wet springs, but um, hopefully not too often. So here's just some uh, an example of some of the lilacs I had cut. And I had a slide in here for viburnums, too. I um, must have jumped over it or um, something, but we do a lot with uh, snowball viburnum. So that is, let me grab my pointer. Um, if you're not familiar with snowball viburnum, it's this. It sort of looks like an Annabelle hydrangea. Um, we do those from cuttings um, and also bare root. It's a really large shrub, like 10 to 12 feet tall shrub. Um, we really condense our growing on them. We only space them 30 inches apart. Um, the Botanical name is it's a viburnum opulus, and you want to look for a specific variety called roseum. Um, that's the variety we use. So we space 30 inches. You can cut green and white. Um, you can put them in a, a hydration solution if you're a flower farmer listening. They will the, that will last longer. You don't have to, but if you want to extend um, extend the life, you can keep them in your cooler uh, for a very long time. They last a long time. Uh, the only problem we've ever had on these is once the flower turns white and matures, uh, they get thrips. If you're not familiar with thrips, it's a small um, insect about the size of like a grease ant, maybe like 1 16th inch. Um, you'll notice some, if you think you might have thrips, go out in your field with a white piece of paper and shake your flower over the piece of paper. And if you see all these little tiny brownish black um, Bugs, that's, that, that would be that. So it's good to check that before you put it in someone's floral bouquet. Uh, nine barks. We do a lot of different varieties of nine barks. Um, we plant them um, from bare roots. You can also um, find them in containers. Uh, we don't propagate any of them because most of the ones we use are patented. The one on the left, this is Amber Jubilee. The one on the right here is Darts Gold. Uh, there's also a few different varieties. Um, 
trying to think off the top of my head. Diablo is another one. Um, Summer Wine, Copertina. There's quite a few of them. Um, the trick to these is to harvest them with, they have a stem, not their brand new growth. Um, it's going to be a woodier, um, when you're feeling through, it's going to be a woodier stem. Um, it's not going to be the brand new growth. It needs to be a hardened off stem. Um, I take my bucket out to the field. I cut these and I remove the bottom third of the foliage and I put them right in water. Um, I don't uh, use a solution or anything uh, with those. Uh, this one on the left here is Little Devil, and then I just stuck some in a vase um, just for a friend on the right side so you can see how they look um, as a filler. The only uh, thing you might run into with some of the nine barks is I do have powdery mildew on them, so I just cut that out. Um, let's see. So uh, one of the main things that we grow are hydrangeas. Uh, the row that you see here are um, limelights. And so uh, we have these planted uh, from bare roots. Um, I did actually, this row here is planted in weed fabric and it has uh, drip tape going down it. So we do keep them hydrated um, so they don't dry out. And in the next slide, I can show you too, I'll maybe quick flip to this. This is where we put a shade cloth on it. So you can see here, um, this is right away in the spring. And this is the row of shade cloth that we have on it. Um, I think that's about a 30% shade cloth. Um, you probably will need something a little bit more like 45 or 55% shade cloth. And here's a good example as to why I suggest a shade cloth. So this is a picture of a flower with no shade cloth. And this is a picture of a hydrangea flower with shade cloth. And what you're seeing here is basically in the morning, the dew and the sun make like a magnifying glass and it's, it's burning some of the petals. Um, so I have found that the shade cloth has been incredibly helpful in, in that. Uh, for we space our hydrangeas is about 48 inches apart. Um, we harvest them when they are completely open when we harvest fresh. So uh, I'll grab my pointer here. If you're seeing some of this chartreuse, different colored growth on the top, those are flowers not quite open. Those are not ready to be cut yet. You need to make sure that this flower is completely white all the way up to the tip. Otherwise, it's just going to wilt. Um, you can harvest them in this stage here too once they've started to blush, um, and they'll hold just fine too. So a shade cloth again. And then here's a picture on the left of fresh hydrangeas I brought to a florist. Um, and um, a picture on the right is what we sell dried. We sell a lot of those to garden centers for making spruce tip planters um, in the fall, fall and winter. And then anything that I don't use, this is that same row, I take the loppers and trim back. Um, the more you, the, the, the reason I do that is because the next year I have really nice long stems. Um, if you don't, it stays bushy with shorter stems. Uh, Annabelle hydrangeas, uh, we do a little bit of those. Uh, they need um, they need a little bit more shade uh, and, and drip, like a drip irrigation or uh, mulch, something to keep them a little bit cooler. Uh, we space 30, 36 inches. Again, making sure the flowers, the white on the left, are completely open is a stage to harvest. And also on the right is green. Um, Excuse me, that's an, also another stage that we harvest them in. Um, these you can propagate by softwood cuttings, which are taking cuttings during the growing season. Um, so if anyone has any questions on softwood harding or taking softwood cuttings um, for these for propagation, um, let me know, but I don't want to get too, um, too caught up in, in those. Uh, we also do endless summer and endless summer bloom stocks um, of the hydrangea macrophyllas. Uh, these are can be a little trickier to grow, uh, but we've had pretty good luck. We have, you can see they're in fabric. I have a, several lines of um, drip tape running on them, so we keep them hydrated uh, in a full sun. They will burn a little bit like you saw the limelight, so they like a 33% shade cloth would be helpful, 30 40%, anything, once they have an established flower. Uh, these can be harvested at the stage similar to where you're seeing. They need to be fully open and fully colored, all the leaves um, removed. 
And then someone told me they had really good luck with um, extending the life by putting them in pickling alm. And um, so I'm doing some trials with that. I don't have any um, factual information exactly on how much extended day life, but I, I, I'm going to try it and see what happens. Uh, the ones on the right are, let's see right here, is what they look like once they have dried. They form this nice ruby red color. And so you can harvest them at that stage and sell them at that stage as well. Uh, Ilex. So the Ilex, we are growing uh, several different varieties. Um, if you're not familiar with Ilex, they need a male and a female plant um, to pollinate. So we plant, uh, ten, we plant one male for every 10 females. Um, and uh, there's a few different kinds. Some of the main varieties people use are like Afterglow, Red Sprite, Winter Red, Winter Gold. Um, I know Proven Winners has Berry, berry Golden, Berry Nice, uh, Berry Heavies, a series um, that's supposed to be really nice too. And so depending on which varieties you use, some get larger than others will dictate your spacing. I planted these bare root. We plant them in fabric. Um, the one on the right is not my picture. That's from the conservatory in um, St. Paul I saw last week. But that's what the berries look like after they froze. On the left is in my field what they look like at the time of harvest. So you want to harvest them when they're completely covered. Um, you don't want to harvest them before that because they're not going to really ripen after that. Um, sometimes they'll be defoliated. Sometimes we hand defoliate. But this is definitely a three-year crop at least. Um, you don't want to start picking ahead of time. You really want them to get established before you start harvesting. Um, and I think about maybe 10 to 20 stems average per plant. I don't know for sure. It's still a, uh, a pretty new crop for us. Um, the vase life tends to be around a week to two weeks. Um, otherwise, I this year I did harvest just a handful and I use them for um, dried arrangements. And then a few different ones on the left is a prunus like a pink almond or you can do uh, like a double flowering um, almond like a prunus triloba that's this one right here um, oops I lost my uh, cursor there okay uh, there so we have a few of these planted um, they seem to winter kill a little bit so uh, just with caution plant these um, bear root in containers the flower is early uh, early to mid-may in Minnesota about a seven day harvest and these are kind of a fun one to try too. These are um, coral berries. Um, this is a pink one called uh, Sweet. There's a few different varieties too. Um, these berries come out like the last part of fall, um, October, late September, October. Um, so the foliage can get a little kind of icky, but um, you, can, you can either hide the foliage or defoliate them a little bit and you'll have a uh, berry. They come in white, pink, um, Make some a nice a nice berry um, for for late late season. Also, we do some um, apples, plums, um, crab apples. I haven't done as much because of the Japanese beetles, but we basically harvest these um, just when the buds are starting to color. Um, cut the branches back, and then we bring them to the garden center. Um, you can force them. I haven't done that before, but you can do that. Also smoke bush, lots of different varieties of smoke bush we use as foliage and flower. The trick to this is harvesting when the, the um, stems are hard and woody. Um, you don't want to harvest any stems from new growth. Um, they'll last about seven to 10 days as well. And hops, we do some hops. They're kind of a wild beast. Um, I order all my hops from Great Lakes, uh, all my rhizomes from Great Lakes hops. Um, to make sure we have you want clean stock. Um, so the best way to grow these, I would suggest researching um, what trellis system you want to use. We just use fence posts and twine. Pick the vet, the top one or two um, the uh, stems, and then we prune everything else and let them uh, let them grow up. You can harvest them green, or I have a picture here. You can harvest them dry. Uh, they're very brittle, but they're really really nice to use in floral arrangements. Uh, bittersweet, we do um, a big crop of bittersweet. We use, we grow from um, bare root. We use a um, autumn revolution. It has male and female parts on the flower, so you don't need um, two different plants. 
and we do completely defoliate them. These are our late summer fall crop for us. It is a five year, it's a five year from planting bare root to getting a full harvest is about five years. Um, there's my daughter being a model, but we take all the foliage off. Um, we harvest these when they are gumball size. And then 24 hours later, um, so we'll, we'll harvest them, defoliate them, we hang them upside down in bundles. 24 hours later, they open to this. Um, it's best just to, um, to um, defoliate at the time of harvest. It gets, I know a lot, a majority of people don't defoliate. Uh, we find that it is more help, uh, more, it is helpful to defoliate right away and that the customer base we're selling to prefers them defoliated. And so um, if you do that, just account for your time and add that into your price accordingly. Okay, I'm gonna go into a little bit of our growing practices. This is basically what our field looks like when we first start planting. Um, so we till, uh, we lay fabric, um, we use a, a, um, the drip tape down, this is our bare root. Um, I believe if you have any questions on what size um, drip tape that we're using, um, it's a Netafim um, drip tape, I believe 15 mil, I think is the one that we use for most of our, um, most of our, um, our um, field. Uh, we space about seven feet in between rows. Um, that fits my husband's tractor can go through with the tiller then. And we also cover crop clover in between. Um, so once this is planted to the right and to the left of this row, we'll put down a cover crop of clover. We use a New Zealand, a New Zealand clover, if you're familiar with that. All of our plantings are fertilized with sustain. Uh, we use an 844 slow release, or we use root feeder packs a lot on our bare root. 16, 4, 8. We are putting our drip tape above the fabric. On the right here is a picture of raspberry. If you've not planted bare root before, it basically comes just a branch with roots. We plant it right above this level. Right here is it with the planting level. Um, so this, when we get our bare root in, uh, it goes right out to the field. We get it in the third week of April from Bailey Nurseries. We soak everything in buckets. We take our Falco number two, we trim the roots, and we trim the branches. This is the only picture that I had that showed uh, soaking of the buckets. You will have breakage. Something that deep is I want you is that would that we would not keep. Um, that happens in bundling and things like that. Um, but most of this this is cardinal dogwood, so that came in um, that way. So uh, we'll. If you're not seeing after you plant bare root, if you're not familiar with it, we water it in really well. And then um, if I don't see some of the buds breaking, I'll even go out with like a hose and just sprinkle water on the buds to try to get that moisture to try to get them to break. Uh, this is my 86 year old grandpa. He comes and helps me in the spring plant everything. So you can see we laid all of our fabric. I do use, if the holes don't need to be that large, I have a drill and I have a bulb digger like an auger and I'll hook that up to a cordless drill and I'll just go down the line and dig up my holes with that if you have one of those it's super handy otherwise I um my grandpa and I will hand dig them and then you can see um this is our if you're not familiar with the rut feeder um packs from sustain that's a picture of that right there and then there's my helper planted and we water everything in um here's our 844 sustain so we also do inventory estimates. This is my husband, he's helping me out. He'll go through and before the season, we estimate every size and variety of what we have and take note. Um, this is our harvest. Um, we are, this is a picture of harvesting dogwoods. We do a pretty good cut on most of our um, things, three to four inches. We'll go through and cut down the field. Um, in regards to doing our inventory, the reason we do that I kind of skipped over is because we like to know exactly what we have in the field and have everything sold before we've even cut it is our goal. That doesn't always happen, but but um, that's our goal. So the, here's some pictures of our harvest. We load everything up. On the right is an example of what they look like bundled. Uh, defoliating is something we don't like to do. These are fantails. They're notorious for hanging on to their foliage. So um, my kids were all really sick, and so all the fantails had to come onto my kitchen floor, and I hand defoliated every single one um, before they went out. 
uh, let's see. I don't want to run over time too much, so I'll just skip skim through some our post harvest treatments here. Um, clean buckets. I can't. Uh, uh, my kids and I, we clean all the buckets, so they, I know they always say you have to be able to drink out of your buckets. They should be that clean. So we just use Dawn dish soap. I, I know you can use bleach, too. Um, all of our buckets, when we're harvesting foliage and flowers, um, everything comes out to the field with us. Um, but we do everything um, in sanitized buckets. If you are planning on storing, I know I talked about holding solutions. Um, I've used these tea bags before, the Crystal Number Two tea bags. Um, if you're using something where you um, need to hold it and use like a bleach product, that's a CVBN. That's an example of that. I don't usually have to hold too much, so I haven't had to work with these two products too much. But these would be the two that you'd want to use. Um, grading. Once we have all of our uh, this is in regards to a lot of our dogwoods and willows. We'll bring everything in in the fall in our shed after it's all harvested and everything gets graded into three sizes. Tips, a three to four foot size and five foot plus. We grade piles um, of that and then we will bundle 10 per bundle in our three to four foot size, five per bundle in our five foot size, and then we grade approximately 20 tips per bundle. And then I have a little note here on just, uh, we really, um, in regards to what we call completing the package. So everything that comes off of our farm is banded. Um, it has a blue sky, in addition to its size take, it will also have a blue sky take on it um, with our information and our logo. Every order goes out with a packing slip without pricing. Um, with our logo, same information. We also have, um, all of our invoices have the same information. Um, we try to grade everything generously. So if you order two to three foot, you're not getting exactly 24 inches. Everything's usually 30 inches or above. Uh, we quality control every single order that goes out. We feel something is like, oh, geez, I'm not quite sure. It does not go out. So um, we double check every single order we send out. It's mostly just me and my husband when he's there. So we try to... Um, try to double check everything. So uh, I'll just touch a little bit on propagation. Uh, most of the things I talked about taking hardwood cuttings, we take a 12 inch cutting, um, a hardwood cutting is usually a cutting um, from roughly like October to April, if you think of when it's dormant. Um, that's the time that we take hardwood cuttings. Um, some people will stick them right away. We refrigerate our cuttings and plant them in the spring. Um, a lot of literature says to take like an 18 to 24 inch cutting and just um, have six inches in the ground, we find that just uh, like a 12 inch cutting, it's going to be a little bit thicker than a pencil, um, is the best cutting for us. And then I know I've mentioned um, patent and trademark, so I just wanted to bring that up. If you're not sure what that means or not sure if your plant that you want to propagate is patented, um, if you just do a Google search, um, you'll come across and you will see like PP, that means plant patented. So this particular variety cannot be propagated. So I always um, let people know when I, I sort of stay away from those and just order those in beer and containers. And I'll buzz through some of the challenges we have with growing woodies. Hail. Hail is one of our main challenges. Uh, these are some golden curls and they develop callus from hail. Uh, that whole crop um, at my in-laws farm, we have uh, some stuff still planted there. We um, had a campfire. Deer, if you have deer in your area, um, I'm going to click on my clicker. This right here is deer damage. They nibble all the tips and then they form these short stubby branches. Um, so if you're thinking about doing this and have deer in your area, um, think about uh, some measures or fencing for control. Uh, rabbits notoriously love pussy willows. So the, during the winter months, um, they'll gnaw these stems um, right here. Uh, we've had uh, um, soft flies on willows. Um, these will basically defoliate your plants in a couple of days. Um, we've only had, we've only had them once, um, but uh, the only really way to get rid of them is you do have to spray them. And Japanese beetles, I'm sure you have a lot of those in Iowa. Um, this is they love our roses. Um, on the right is basically what they've left of 
our apple trees. Um, so I know some people have suggested um, they've had some luck with milky spore. Um, that can get, I know, I know it's a little expensive. Um, it goes onto your turf uh, to try to get the grub portion of this. Um, and I know some people have sprayed too. So, uh, so a few different things that you can do for those, but that's definitely a challenge that we've had with Japanese beetles. They've just been horrific the last couple of years. Um, and then I wanted to show my garden spiders. Um, we have quite a few, not quite a few, we have a handful of them. It's just a yellow garden spider. They're virtually harmless unless, um, unless they're the disturbed, but it's really hard to cut woodies around these ginormous spiders. Um, so I thought I would include a picture of um, that. We have seen occasionally, this is, um, this is a fungus that can come, sometimes come on willows when they have a cold snap in February and then they warm up, you have a little bit of tip dieback. Um, if you ever see something like this, you want to just cut 12 inches underneath, sanitize your pruners, and then throw that plant material away in the garbage. Um, weed pressure is a challenge. This is at my in-laws house. This is a field without fabric that we mow. <clears throat> Hard frost on the left is the um, hydrangea macrophyllas. When we have a hard frost, they really die back to the ground, so now they won't flower until real late in the season. And on the right is a picture of me digging out some dogwoods. Um, we had a blizzard come through before we were done harvesting, and so we are digging in about 40 inches of snow to dig them out and get them harvested. Um, lots of avenues of sales I included. We sell wholesale only. We don't sell direct to the consumer. Um, landscape, garden, landscape, garden centers, um, florists is our primary market. 75% of what we sell, um, and we sell within 45 miles of our farm. I included this um, just for some additional information. There's three other farmers I know that have pretty... Um, pretty good size woodies that they grow if you want to look them up and see what their practices are. It's always neat to see what other people are doing. Um, if you're on Facebook, there's a flower farmers uh, group that's really helpful. And I am a member of the Association of Specially Cut Flower Growers. Um, they have just a ton of information. Um, if you're looking for more on the, on the cut flower woody side of things too, there's quite a bit of information there that they have. Um, here are the three books that, some of the go-to books. I think someone had posted some some um, sites, so thank you. I'll take a look at those two. Um, these are some really good references I found that have been very helpful. And then um, lastly, kind of a little snapshot of where I purchased my supplies. A lot of things I get from BFG Supply Company. Um, they have uh, the weed fabric, um, they have drip tape, um, fertilizer, uh, Pretty much anything you can, you're looking for. Um, tools, Am Leonard and Johnny's. So most of my bear rep comes from Bailey Nurseries. I've never ordered from Illinois Willow, but um, he does sell a lot of um, the hardwood cuttings. If you're looking to try starting some, he um, I saw that he had posted he had some for sale um, right now. Uh, local retail sale nurseries. I've also got seedlings just from county sales. Um, our county has a seedling sale every spring. And then I'll touch um, lastly on social media and advertising. Um, we don't, uh, I don't do any paid advertising. I haven't had to do that yet. Um, most everything I post on Instagram. So once I've harvested something, um, I'll post it right away on my Instagram um, that it's available. Um, I also do that on my Facebook. And then I have a MailChimp account, which is uh, this right here, the MailChimp. It's an email server, so you can um, go in and put your customers or um, your email list in this, and you can uh, edit it or customize it with pictures, and I will put in all of our seasonal availability. So Pussy Willows, um, I'll send something that goes out. Um, during the summer, if I have peony, or excuse me, the spring, I'll do our peonies, um, and in the winter or fall here, I'll send out our availability. Um, it's a really nice tool. You, it will track exactly who clicks and opens your emails. Um, and so I like, I like to send that out, um, with our availability in an order form. And so we try, like I said before, to get everything sold before we harvest as much as possible. And this is, I would say one of our main tools in doing that. And I think my time is up. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, please let me know if I missed some along the way. 
Rachel, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, just packed full of nice details. Um, there were a few questions. So yeah, we do have plenty of time for questions. So if you've got them, folks, go ahead and get it in the chat box. Um, Rachel, I wanted to point to, uh, looks like one or two a little ways up in the chat box that were missed. Rob had asked about um, any issues that you have removing insects from flowers, especially lilacs and hydrangeas, before taking them to the florist. Is there anything that you do to prevent, you know, taking bugs to the florist? Um, you, I, uh, we, the main group that I sell my flowers to is called the Twin Cities Flower Market. Um, they're a wholesale market here um, in the Twin Cities, and they're, uh, one of their prerequisites is uh, chemical free. So we do not spray anything on our flowers. So basically, um, in order to keep the insects off, I'm just sort of either manually removing them or shaking them gently. Um, I, I do had, I did have some dahlias where some incredibly, really scary looking insects crawled out in my car. Um, but I, I don't, I don't have a, um, I don't have a magic trick on that. I sort of just shake them out or I have to manually remove them. Um, a lot of, I yep. think, you know, people put them in their coolers and I don't necessarily think, um, they probably just go a little dormant, but then they <laughs> revive once they're out. But I just, we just take a look at them on the hydrangeas. We don't usually have too many insects on those that we have to worry too much about that. Yep. Good to know. Cool. Yeah, and you um, are a quick enough turnaround. You you don't have any sort of cooler, right? That you use. Uh, we do have a uh, we do have a small floral cooler, and we're in the process of a large walk-in cooler. Oh, okay. Being built. So yeah, we do have we do have uh, two small coolers. I should say we use mostly for our peonies, um, and a little bit for our fresh cuts. But a lot of our flowers I harvest um, the same day I drop off. Just so they're mm -hmm. really fresh. So then Kathy had a question just after that was uh, about the nine bark and she asked uh, if you plant that in the spring or the fall and or the fall. Oh uh, you could do spring or fall if you're doing a container. Um, I plant it right away in the spring um, from bare root. A bare root plant. Mm -hmm. And did you say yeah your your bare roots uh, or you, you generally do all those like about the third week of April is that right? Yes, bare roots third week of April. And um, if if you're not familiar with bare root product, it's basically um, so bare root is grown uh, at a like a large nur or at a nursery and it's harvested in the fall. Um, it's brought into a cooler and held uh, like 34, 36 degrees and 90. Oh, by a six, eight percent humidity, um, and it's graded out. It's completely defoliated. There's no soil on the roots, and so it's essentially dormant. And so you want to plant it before your season warms up. So I found like the lap, the third, about the third week of April in Minnesota for our climate is about the right time to plant it because you don't want to be planting beer root when it's really hot out. Um, but it uh, it basically looks when you when you use it it looks like a dormant plant. Okay. Yeah. So there's a couple more questions here, but yeah, just folks, we've got plenty of time if you have some more questions for Rachel. Um, it looks like Carl shared shared a few links for people to check out, and then uh, had asked Rachel if you. Uh, consider you, you talked about your fertilizers do you use any compost or compost tea Kyle Carl was wondering um, I've never used a compost tea but we do compost and have a huge compost pile of our own um, that we incorporate into our soil um, but I have not tried the con the composted tea the sustained fertilizer um, is a composted turkey manure um, and so that we have found really adds a lot back into the soil. Um, we don't use any um, synthetic fertilizers. We found that the sustain that uh, turkey manure, composted turkey manure, has really been the cat's meow. The cat's meow, all right. <laughs> um. uh, all that in there. <laughs> So uh, yeah, it looks like uh, you already addressed Rob's question about insects on on cut flowers. Um, and then Clara has a question. 
Um, about profitability, this is a good question. So, yeah, do you, how do you think the profitability of Woody's compares to annual cut flowers like per acre if you had to kind of guesstimate or if, or if you track that? Um, Any idea? Hmm. I don't. I actually, I don't know. That is a really great question. I wish I had an answer for that. Um, I know I've seen some uh, studies out there, Woody's wise. Um, but I, I haven't done it side by side. I should. That is a very good question. I should compare and see what it is. I know once you have the Woody's it's, established, it can be pretty profitable. Um, and you don't have as much of the labor into it because you're really, you know, once they're planted, you know, besides a little bit of maintenance, you're really only working with, and I'm speaking in regards to the pussy willows and the, the spring, the pussy willows, and then the fall, the dogwoods and willows, you're really only harvesting um at those two times of the year there's not a ton of maintenance in between so from a labor perspective um um you don't have a, a too much into them if if you have the space for it yep good point and, and you had mentioned going through the varieties uh on some of them you know about the lifespan that you'd expect from that are there most of the woodies like it you know it, do you have, I'm sure everyone varies a little bit, and this shows that I don't know a whole lot about this, but um, does that, is there a huge range in the lifespan between the different varieties that you grow for woodies, or is it, um, you know, five years kind of a reasonable expectation, or some of them 10 to 15 years, or do you have any any comment on the lifespan for those? Because that would greatly decrease it, your labor if you don't have to plant these every year, which would probably increase your profitability. Uh, no, I think that kind of varies, too, with how hard you cut on them. Um, so we're cutting, so, um, the willows and dogwoods in that respect, um, you'll get a few things off of them the first couple years and probably a really full harvest about the third year. Um, but you'll have many, many years after that to continuously harvest. It's not that after the third year, then, oh, you have to dig them up and replant them. Um, they'll last quite a bit longer. You know, you'll be able to get some really good, several years of really good cuts out of them. Um, I don't know exactly how many, um, the ones we have at, um, my in-laws house, we planted about eight years ago and we are still, I mean, we're definitely still cutting off those. I haven't seen a decline, um, at all in their vigor or growth. Um, so I, I don't know for sure the lifespan. I, I, I think it really depends on, um, a couple of different factors, you know, how it's growing, what types of stresses it has on it, and how hard you're cutting them back every year. Yep. Good point. Yep. Um, okay, so it looks like maybe the next question in the box there is from Jake that was asking about the hydrangeas. Um, he said in a photo that you, where you were cutting back the hydrangeas, they were laying off on the ground. Are you coming back and mowing them or leaving them as they lie? You remember that? We could go back maybe to find that. Yeah, I do. I think I know. Uh, let's see here. I'll flip back through. No, oh, let's see. I think it was... Oh, that one, I bet. Uh, so the ones that are remaining here on the left, they were blowing away in the wind a little bit. But those, I actually came back through and um, I raked them into a pile and I composted them on that one. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. So, yep, I came back through and cleaned that up. But I uh, wanted to show that um, regardless, we, we take all the blooms off at the end of the season. Actually, excuse me, this is in the spring. I cut them back in the spring. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So, um, yeah, I think you mentioned this, but Clara is asking about how big is your growing area. Did you say just two acres? It's under two acres, yes. Yep, so okay. we, um, we grow pretty tight. Yep, yeah. and that includes your, th those, um, that includes the, the row spacing in between your rows where, for your mower to get through and everything. So that the total yes. acreage would be two acres. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. 
cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then it uh, looks like we got a few more in here. Um, Mark wants to know, will willows grow in wetter soils like native willows? Any idea? Um, they can tolerate some, they can tolerate, tolerate quite a bit of moisture. Um, at our, my in-laws farm, they have a part of the cow pasture that floods every year and a lot of the native willows do really well there. Um, our stuff doesn't like to be sitting in water, but it will tolerate, um, a wetter area, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't plant in an area where you're having any standing water or an area that floods. Um, but it can handle a moist, a moister soil. Okay. Um, yeah, so Martha has a question then again about the mock orange again, and she said, what variety is it that you grow, and is it a quick grower? Oh, uh, yeah, so mock orange, is, the double that I grow is called Snowbell. Um, and the ones, I want to see if I, I don't think we're too far away from them. Yeah, Snowbell. Um, so these plants, this is a second year, sec, I believe this is a second year harvest on them. So I believe I planted them bare root the year before. I'm almost positive on these ones. It was just the second year. So they grow pretty quick. Um, I think I started with either a six inch or a 12 inch bare rud. I planted in the spring um, and they had a full growing season. And then I harvested, um, I believe I harvested these off that crop. But uh, uh, if I didn't, it was the year after. I can't remember for sure, but um, they grow fairly quick. They do. Cool, yeah. Um, yeah, and then Jake's got a question. Uh, so you're on just a little bit less than two acres, and it sounds like you've got a little bit of help from your kids and a little bit of help from your husband. But um, what do you think is manageable for doing it on your own, basically? And uh, if you were to scale up, when would you? Do you have any idea about when you'd need additional labor? Um. So uh, it's hard to know for sure because. Um, my time is sort of split um, between my kids and between doing this. So it, I, I don't know exactly know if I did it full time. Uh, I think for myself with the, the my family dynamic, I'm at max right now with what I have. I don't think there's much more I could do as I have plant orders coming in this spring. Um, so I, I'm expanding a little bit. I have... Um, more bittersweet I think I'm planting I think I had like 50 more bittersweet and then maybe a few hundred more plants and then I'm uh, annuals and perennials and stuff I'm doing but I think I have a few hundred more woodies I'll plant out and then I think I'll be getting close to that but as far as someone doing it full-time um, I would think that that would be fairly uh, uh, manageable definitely manageable yeah good to know um yeah, so then Claire's asking about your row spacing. Um, yeah, what is it? What kind of space do you leave? I, I, you mentioned when you were talking about varieties, the, the spacing yeah, between the we, plants. So we can go back and, and see that. But between the rows, what do you do? Uh, the rows, we are, our main rows, we call our driving rows, are a close to seven feet. And the reason we picked that is because that's the space we needed to get our tractor through uh, for tilling. We put a tiller on the back of a, a small tractor that we have, and that was we wanted the least amount of space possible because it's um, it's basically you're uh, you know you're not making any money off of that sp space. It's just a thorough way. So we did the smallest space possible, which was it's about seven feet for our tractor to drive through. Um, we have started doing a little bit more um, back to back rows and what I mean by that is instead of having like a row of hydrangeas and then like seven feet or like a row um, um, excuse me I've broken it up and put a few smaller like three foot rows where I can just get a mower down them um, and then we've just kept the outside rows around seven feet and now we're just eating up those middle rows to maximize our space and those are about I would say three to four feet they just fit a riding lawnmower um, and then I'll mow those, the, that's also in clover. 
Um, I should mention that clover is really aggressive. So it's a very nice co uh, cover crop and it's very nutrient fixing, but it pops up in every single hole. Um, it's very, very, very aggressive, um, but it keeps the weeds. I don't have any other weeds um, down the clover rows um, and it attracts a lot of bees. So it does have a lot of pros to it. Um, I hope they answered the question. So lawnmower length in between um, a lot of the variety rows where we have clover and then it's a seven foot thorough drive through rows for a tractor in tiller. Yep, definitely. And and Jake's got another question then about the drip tape, which um, are you rolling that up before the winter or do you leave that out? Because I think you said it's under your plastic, right? So how do you handle that at the end of the season? Uh, we actually put it on top of fabric, the fabric that we use. Um, yeah, so we, we don't use any, um, any plastic at all on the farm. Everything is fabric. That fabric stays down. We do not remove it, even with the annuals and perennials. Um, we don't um, dig that up and retail and recompost. We um, will um, top dress with um, the sustained compost, but we do not dig up the fabric. And in hindsight, I, pro I, I did leave the drip tape out. I, I suppose I probably could have brought it in for the winter because I'm, sure, um, I'm sure the elements are going to not be kind on it. But I did leave it out all winter. So this is the first year I had drip tape. Um, this, this last season was the first season. Otherwise, I've hand watered, hand watered everything or used soaker hoses. So it was a blessing having that. Um, in regards to that, that drip line, um, I had a one inch head row, if, you, if you're familiar with that, I had a one inch um, head row and then 20, 150 foot, roughly 20, 150 foot lines come off of that. And I could run about six lines at a time. If yep, that makes I think sense it does. to the people listening that have, are familiar with that. Yeah, product. Thank you. Um, and then two questions when you mentioned clover, okay. two questions here that what was the clover variety that you plant? Oh sure. Um, the one that uh, the one that we use is um, New Zealand. Um, it's not white clover. Um, it's similar to white clover. It's supposed to have a little bit better. Um, the cover crop is very similar to white clover. It's, it's uh, the one that we chose. New Zealand is supposed to be a little bit hardier for our area, and it's taller. Um, we wanted a little bit of a taller cover crop. Um, so that's the one that we okay. that we chose. And uh, then Kelly's asking uh, about the wholesale prices for your bundles. Um, maybe that varies, but is that something you're willing to share what those are? Uh, sure. So a little background on, um, on your pricing. It really depends on who you're selling to. So um, we have price points that we use for garden centers and we have price points um, for different products like the foliage and the flower woodies. Um, it's really across the board. Um, if you are interested in like the woody flower prices, a lot of times I'll look it up. Um, they have some, you can see what like the current market prices are for them. Um, but it really, the, the woodies, I can kind of give you a range depending on what it is. If you're anywhere from like five to ten dollars per bundle, it really depends on what size bundle, what sizes, and the quality of product and your market. So, are you selling garden centers, retail, uh, farmers market, florists? It's all going to be a little bit different. But I think if you're in like the five to twelve, fifteen dollar range, um, and same with like some of the florals, um, that's going to be similar. The exception of bittersweet is um, a lot more than that. You need to get a little north on if on the wholesale price for bittersweet um there's a uh and that's um we sell for quite a bit more because we we grow it uh very naturally and we hand pick it and we hand defoliate it um so we charge a little bit more for it for our market but um I, uh, our market is twin cities metro and so that might be different than some other people's market so uh, when we figure price, we're looking at market, we're looking at our inputs, how much do we have into it? We keep track. Um, I keep track of all my labor hours, um, put that into it. Um, and that's how we establish our pricing. Good. Okay. Um, and, and again, about the, uh, about the clover then, are you reseeding that, uh, at any 
frequency or and does it does it lose its vigor over time? Uh, so the um, the roads that we have going east to west, oh no, it would be north to south, I believe, are still very vigorous. We have one of our main thoroughways that goes the opposite direction. This was the first fall we've noticed that we're going to till it in the spring and we will receive that. And that was planted, it'll be four years ago in June, I believe we planted that. Um, the other rows are pretty good, so that will be the first. Um, that will be the first year we'll have to replant just that. Just that. I think we'll replant just that one line in the back that we had. The other ones are still um, doing really well. Okay, and uh, just enough time for a couple more questions. So if you've got one, get it in the chat box now, or forever hold your peace. Um, so Jake's then asking about the landscape fabric. Um, how are you pinning that down? Do you use uh, <laughs> fabric staples or do you cover it with soil? Or what is your method? Uh, yeah, so we use the um, landscape pins. They look like tent, like tent stakes, land stakes. Yep. Land, um, if you know what I'm talking about, the landscape pins. Um, so we will, we'll till, um, we trench the sides and we bury the sides with soil and then we pin all the way down. Um, it gets pretty windy here. So, um, the pins are kind of expensive, but, um, we've had a few blow up and so we aggressively pin them down. Um, and then we, we do, um, soil on each side of them, um, to hold the fabric down okay, as well. Okay, good to so know. We do both. Um, yeah. And so then about selling to the florists. Is it, um, was it the Twin Cities flower market that you said that is kind of your middleman for the, for the florists? Uh, yeah, so I do, I do both. So, um, the Twin Cities flower exchange is a place that I can sell to, um, it's coordinated by a woman, Christine Hoffman. So she coordinates uh, local growers, and we all there's I I think she has I don't know 15 to 20 I I, I shouldn't guess actually I don't know um, quite a few local growers that bring flowers there, and then she coordinates the following day is a wholesale market for local florists, um, and so a good a majority of our flowers do go there. Um, but I also do um, sell separately to a few different florists. So I do both. I do both avenues. Okay. Um, well, yeah. Thank you, Kathy. I agree. Um, this is a great job from Rachel, and, and it looks like she's another specially cut flower grower member, and she's going to share um, about this webinar. So we will have this recorded on our uh, farm in our archive within a couple days. Um, and actually, since we have our annual conference on uh, starting technically Thursday. Um, it might be next week before it gets into our archive, but we are recording this and we'll have it up. So if anybody wants to revisit this and share it with anybody, uh, please find that at practicalfarmers.org. Um, but Rachel, this was packed full of great detail. What a fantastic presentation. So thank you very much for taking the time to share with us. Um, we, we, I loved it and it'll be great to have in our archives. And thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, one more plug to take the survey before you sign out. I'd appreciate that. But um, thanks for joining us on this Tuesday night. We're off next Tuesday, and then we'll be back for another several weeks. So thanks, Rachel. Yeah, thanks, everyone.